Welcome back to the Money in Banking video series. In part two, we will highlight three features of a debt run-up and then illustrate how a financial economy copes with an adverse shock in a world without central bank interventions. In particular, we will focus on two adverse feedback loops, the liquidity spiral and the disinflation spiral. You will also learn about the new paradox of prudence. So far, we have set up the economy. The financial system facilitates borrowing and lending across agents. The government, along with the central bank, offers some safe asset in form of reserves. Let's start by noting that it is the buildup of short-term debt that makes the economy vulnerable to a financial crisis. There are three aspects of debt dynamics that we would like to highlight up front. First, the run-up in debt can occur in different sectors from crisis to crisis. For example, in Japan in the 1980s, the debt level increased significantly in the corporate sector. In contrast, in the United States in the 2000s, a run-up of debt occurred in the household sector, while the corporate sector's debt increased only marginally. Second, typically, when there is a run-up in debt, whichever sector it may be, the financial sector is also issuing more debt. The third stylist fact is that the government's debt rises sharply after the crisis erupts. The debt run-up can be benign and simply be a sign of financial deepening. But what if the economy experiences an adverse shock? Will the economy stop functioning? How does an indebted economy cope with an adverse shock in a world in which the government and central bank stay passive? Suppose some of the end borrowers suffer an adverse shock and as a consequence, they are less likely to pay back their debt. To see how the shock is amplified into a large financial crisis, it is useful to split up the impact of this adverse shock into four steps. First, the direct impact of the shock on the assets of the banks. Second, the response of the banks shrinking the balance sheet Third, the impact on asset prices. Fourth, the impact on the real value of inside money. The first step is the immediate impact of the adverse shock on the end borrower's ability to repay their loans. This directly translates into a decline in the value of the bank's assets. Looking at the asset side of the bank's balance sheet, a decline in the value of credit, say by 5%, leads to a much larger percentage decline in equity. Liabilities in form of inside money stay the same, and all the losses have to be absorbed by the equity. Since equity declines in percentage terms by much more than banks' assets, the asset-to-equity ratio of the banks, that is the leverage ratio, is shooting up. The second step is the bank's response. The high leverage ratio caused by the adverse shock triggers a response by the banks. They try to bring it back down by shrinking the balance sheet. First, they will extend less new credit to the end borrowers, who then can buy fewer homes and invest in fewer machines. Second, banks will also try to sell off old loans, old credit. If banks are hit, then they all would like to sell their assets at the same time. But if no bank wants to buy, who will be willing to buy these assets? The only ones that are potentially willing to buy these assets are the savers directly. However, remember that savers are not as good as banks at enforcing the repayment of the loans, and they cannot diversify as well as the banks are able to. Hence, they are not willing to pay much for these assets and as the prices will drop. The third step is the liquidity spiral. As banks fire sell their old loans and credit, assets are worth less, resulting in further losses and a decline in banks' equity. This triggers further fire sales, rise in risk premia, and so forth. Paradoxically, each individual bank's effort to deliver 
that is to be microprudent is macroimprudent as it increases overall volatility. Our paradox of prudence is to risk taking what Keynes' paradox of thrift is to saving. Each individual's attempt to save more reduces others' income and ultimately overall savings. Here, each individual bank's attempt to reduce its risk increases the overall systemic macro risk. The fourth step is the disinflationary spiral on the liability side of the banks. As banks shrink the balance sheet, they also shrink the amount of money they are creating. In other words, the supply of inside money declines, and with it, the money multiplier. In addition, households' money demand rises, since households are now exposed to additional idiosyncratic risk, which banks ceased to diversify away. Without intervention of the central bank, outside money is fixed. As banks shrink the balance sheet, total money supply declines. As this happens, the value of money rises. Goods are getting cheaper. Disinflation is kicking in. As the value of money increases, so does the value of banks' liability, as shown graphically. Recall, banks owe savers money, so savers are benefiting while banks are losing. This increase in the value of money hurts the bank's equity even further. Again, the decline in equity raises the leverage ratio further, feeding the liquidity spiral and the debt disinflationary spiral. Overall, risk premium rise and investors demand a higher compensation for taking on risk. To recap, we have separated the shock into four steps, which of course occur simultaneously. First, there was an initial shock that impaired the assets. Second, the response of the banks was to shrink the balance sheets, cut back on new loans, and fire sell the old outstanding credit. Third, this led to a liquidity spiral, lowering asset prices and forcing further sell-offs. Fourth, the decline in the supply of inside money and the rise in demand of money led to disinflation, which increased the real value of debt that banks owe to the savers. All this significantly lowered banks' equity and gave rise to risk premium. In sum, a small shock has large persistent effects on the real economy and hurts especially the levered sector, including banks. We have analyzed the impact of an adverse shock on financial stability, price stability, and we have gained a better understanding of their interaction. We have seen that the banks are hit on both sides of the balance sheets on the asset side and on the liability side. We have two spirals, the liquidity spiral and the disinflationary spiral. Because of the liquidity spiral, we have less new credit, fire sales, declines in asset prices, declines in investment and economic growth. On the liability side, the disinflation spiral is at work. Deposits decline, the real value of money and debt rises, the money multiplier collapses. Overall, banks' adverse shocks are amplified and can persist. Both lead to systemic risk, risk endogenously generated by the system. To sum up, part two of this video series taught us how spirals amplify a small adverse shock if central banks stay passive. Click on part three to learn how monetary policy can contain the amplification.